First of all, uh, I, I want to tell you I do improv as in comedy improv. And one of the key tenets of improv is you're supposed to give gifts to your partner uh, for them to work with and, and, and hopefully be funny and for them to give gifts to you. So uh, you guys have already given me a gift this evening uh, by coming here. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And I'm, I'm hoping my talk will give you a few gifts. Uh, typically when I do this, I'm thinking, my, my humble goal is to change the trajectory of your life. <laughs> so let's see if, if, if I can get you thinking uh, uh, in ways and realizing part of the bits and pieces about yourself that uh, perhaps you didn't fully recognize. And for others, uh, maybe just validation uh, for, for what you do know. So I'm so happy tonight because I get to talk about my two favorite things. Uh, number uh, two is, is talking about creativity and design thinking, and number one is talking about myself. Uh, now, uh, I was told that I have 45 minutes to do a, a five-hour uh, uh, seminar that I normally do. Uh, there's a typo. It's actually a minute and one hour and 45 minutes. For uh, when, when Scott corrected me, I said, all right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk really fast and try to get through this material as quickly as I can. I found that that is a work I So we're going to just cut to the chase and find what is, what is the most important. So first of all, my big thing is uh, you got to know who your user is and what they want. So why don't I just, can I get a raise of hands of folks that think they're, they're creative people? They're naturally creative, just raise your hand. Um, okay, and then the number of folks who maybe one day are thinking about doing or have done entrepreneurship. Raise your hand. Okay. So, how many of you folks, if I met you when you were nine years old, would have been bubbling with tons of ideas and naturally curious and uh, wanting to just learn about things? Is that what most of you guys do? So, basically, our education system in the last 10 or 15 years has been able to stamp that creativity. I am willing to argue that every single one of you guys are creative. We're just going to have to rediscover it, right? So, um, you know, creativity in kind of a conceptual definition is about identifying patterns and then trying something different to change those patterns and come up with a different outcome. Now, by that definition, how many of you guys are creative is looking at patterns being able to maybe do something different so there's a different pattern. How many of you guys? Most everybody, right? I mean, I don't care if you're a lawyer, or accountant, a student. You know, the idea behind creativity is how can I make tomorrow better than today if I'm willing to work at it? So that's what really cr creativity is, is defined as. Now, how many of you guys come up with really cool ideas when you're running, biking, swimming? shower or just walking along, <laughs> right? So the mind, creativity, uh, you know, I'm going to teach creativity as a process, but realizing that the outcomes are big, these crazy zigzags, right? Sometimes they're a drunken walk, how you get to what the solution is. So um, I, I, I think what I've done is, is I have a, a um, website called joestartup.com and its its mission is to to revolutionize bring a entrepreneurship revolution and a creativity revolution and there are a couple of steps for creativity um, the first step is, is developing a mindset for creativity is as I mentioned earlier is, is opening yourself to the gifts that are being presented to you being aware of that and then doing something and then working a process 
which explains uh, the creative mindset, and, and I'm going to elaborate on that. Hi, my name is Joe Startup, and I'm here to help you start up simply. Simply, start up. I think it's four minutes. Today we're going to discuss the creative mindset. My friend Randy says she's not very creative. I tell her I don't buy that. I bet if I met her when she was eight or nine years old, I'd likely see someone incredibly curious, creative, and hungry to learn. Somehow, our education system dims those qualities. In my mind, everyone has a creative talent. It just needs to be rediscovered. It's like a muscle that hasn't been used in a long time. It needs to be nurtured and strengthened by you every day. We often hear how athletes are in the zone where everything just flows naturally. For artists and writers, it seems ideas present themselves almost as gifts with little effort. The reality is, getting into the zone usually happens when there's a mindset, structure, and lots of repetition. Even improv co comedy has a lot of rules to facilitate the creative and often funny scenes. In short, we need a process or mindset that produces creative outcomes. I often use a few exercises to help me. Number one, I imagine that I'm a spy and I have to memorize all the details of a room. What color is the paint? What's the trim light? Where's the light coming from? In this exercise, you're focusing on the present moment. Number two, every day I look for inspiration. It could be interesting art or design to help me understand what is out there and help me define what I want. It can be cool products and businesses on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. Save the ideas in a journal to use as a source of inspiration later. Number three, develop a what makes me frustrated list. Think about the badly solved problems at home, work, transit, or other. What solutions, products, or services could there be to help solve these problems? For example, one woman found that city dwellers wanted to use cars for errands or short trips. The solution was short-term rental cars parked in convenient locations in the city. Listen to what other people's frustrations are and add them to your list. Number four, set aside creative time every day to work. It could be as short as 15 minutes to several hours. After looking at the inspiration journal, spend time being creative. At first, this time will seem hard, but like a muscle, the creativity will come easier if you are consistent. Being creative requires consistency and structure so great ideas appear. Number five, when the day is busy, I stop and count ten breaths. I find this pause helps me concentrate on the moment. Number six, I physically exercise or have a hobby where my mind wanders. This activity is a great time for your brain to process through life's details. Ideally, I just observe the thoughts without forming attachments or feelings. Other times, I participate in an activity or hobby where I have to focus on the present moment and nothing else. Don't pressure yourself to come up with one great idea. Most successful ideas are mashups of previous ideas. Pablo Picasso said, good artists copy, great artists steal. The iPhone is literally a mashup of a phone, music player, and computer applications. eBay is an auction, a several hundred year old idea, and applied online. In fact, many great concepts are ideas from one field and applied to another. So remix ideas from one part of life and apply to another. I find that doing these exercises regularly help get me into the creative zone. Lots of ideas present themselves. You have to be willing to come up with a lot of bad ideas in order to come up with good ideas. Put yourself out there, realizing that the process will ultimately yield good results. Today we discuss the creative mindset. My name is Joe Startup, and I'm here to help you start up simply. Simply, start up. So, part of my background is that I've wandered the world for 22 years, and I saw it got better than what I had. And um, believe it or not, I even studied with some shamans in Siberia, in South America, in the Southwest. And you know, the whole notion of creativity was one that befuddled me when I was younger because I was a philosophy major, okay? I didn't believe in creativity, really. And I didn't, I didn't believe 
design was interesting but kind of frivolous. Now, as I got older um, and, and, and wandered the world and saw what the, the range of human possibility is, I started thinking, wow, design, something besides function. sounds like a really bad idea for a finance and operations guy background to, to get involved in that. What ended up happening was I started looking at lamps everywhere, online, in books. And then I started, um, I started talking to customers and figuring out what interior designers want and things like that. How do lamps fit in the 21st century? And I got to the point where I started dreaming Sometimes I would sketch the lamp and then I would go back to sleep. Okay? Because when you just look at things for hours and hours and you think about it, those sort of things happen. So, you know, I, I after a while I ended up, um, you know, we, we had a certain cut the way it worked at our company was there was market two times a year. So designers would send us designs and we'd uh, get them made and we'd put them out there and if you made and sold a certain number, we'd carry it on. Well, so we had these natural designers, and there are guys out there that just, guys and gals that are just, they just see things differently than, than I do, than most people do. And I just thought they were so cool. And, and so after a while, I thought, well, why don't I start trying to design some lamps? And uh, we put them out there, and I told the other designers, I said, look, uh, if you make the cut, you make the cut. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's Mario Guada, famous New York designer, Larry Laszlo, famous Miami designer of ours, or Alexander Julian, who's a, who's a fashion icon. So the first market I went out there and I, I realized, well, I, I, about 35% of my lamps made the cut, one out of three. And the, and, the, and the really great designers, 45 or 50% of theirs make the cut. So that's not so bad, right? Well, so I tracked it for six markets and my designs were making the cut close to 45 or 50% of the time or some deviation. So somehow, a, a so-called uncreative guy like me was able to go through a process and come up with creative outcomes. And so I kind of went on my way and a couple, maybe three years ago, I heard about this thing called design thinking. And um, I said, well, that's kind of interesting. Um, what is that all about? <coughs> I've been doing design for six or seven years now, and I've been doing product development for about 17. What is it? And, you know, it's something that's been around for a long time that industrial designers and um, architects have been using. But, you know, I think it's like, it's like, it's like this, there's a secret cabal that doesn't want design thinking to come out. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this other video on design thinking which I, I really call the innovation process because most people don't know what design thinking means. This is three minutes and 30 seconds, just to have a Hi, my, my name is Joe Startup, and I'm here to help you start up simply. Simply, start up. Today we're going to discuss the innovation process. My friend Judith tells me that she doesn't have that many cool ideas. I see creativity as the ability to see and convey ideas or emotions 
solutions in a new way. I see innovation as applied creativity or focusing creativity to produce a solution where the author or others see value. A solution may come in the form of a product or service. The innovation process is a structure of channeling the creativity into a solution. The process can be done individually or as a group. Let's take a look at the innovation process, which includes five steps. Remember the acronym PRICE, P-R-I-C-E, PRICE. Let's go through each of the steps. Number one, problem identification. Clearly lay out what the problem is and what the key frustrations are. I finished the phrase, I don't like that. Get as much feedback as you can from potential users. Learn their environment and perceptions to help understand the problem and refine the solution. In the end, it's all about the users. Number two, research the problem, the existing solutions, and the solution providers. Understand the landscape clearly. Google others, talk to customers, other vendors. Leave no stone unturned. Pretend that you're a detective looking for all of the options. Skipping this process may lead to inventing something that already exists. If you understand what the inadequate solutions are out there, you can develop a better solution. Number three, ideate. Use yes and. Think of as many potential solutions as you can. Be messy. Overshoot on the ideas. Write them down no matter how crazy they may seem. Don't be critical here. Just come up with a ton of ideas. When I'm stuck, I ask, what if, to keep going. Number four, curate. Consider the potential solutions side by side and consider ways to combine them. Leave all options on the table. Remix the ideas. Start forming a view on the best parts. Number five, edit. Eliminate ideas based on the benefits, costs, and how realistic they are to execute. Distill down to the highest value, most realistic solution. Price, P-R-I-C-E. At first, I found this process cumbersome and awkward. I'd often edit before I finished the ideation, as well as curate the steps. Innovation takes time. It's not a straight line. It zigs, it zags. Be patient and don't cut the process short. Often, it is building layers on top of each other. The price innovation process can be used by an individual or by a group to channel creativity into a solution. Practice the process until it becomes second nature. Today, we discuss the innovation process. My name is Joe Startup, and I'm here to help you start up simply. Simply, start up. So, my story about me becoming a lamp designer. Uh, I realized that I had gone through the price method without even know that, knowing that I had gone through the price method. So, you know, it's amazing that Scott was able to bring in someone to kind of, kind of talk about the uh, uh So I just, it, it, I, I just. It, as a result, this whole creativity process really resonated with me. And today, of course, we're not going to be able to go through uh, the detailed aspects of the problem and customer identification and how you research. But perhaps one day, um, when a design thinking uh, course is in the works, you'll be able to really drill down and get into the uh, specifics of this. But I think the key thing to do is, is now you understand what the essence is for design thinking. Uh, so, today we've kind of focused on the what it is, why we should do it, when we should do it, the how part. If you come on Saturday at 9 o'clock, 9 to 11, we're going to get into some uh, group sessions, some peer-to-peer, -peer, and we're going to infuse some improv, and I'm nearly certain this will be the funnest two hours of training you'll ever do in your entire life. Okay. So, um, that's... That's what the, what the innovation process is. Um, the notion of how do I come up with a, as many fuzzy ideas as I can without adding them is a really important one because most of them are going to be bad ideas. But you may have two or three gems, and the best ideas tend to come from gems.
just this side of crazy. Uh, if, you're, if you're in a group, somebody may say something really ludicrous, and then the next suggestion just inside of that ludicrous, that's going to be the best thing. So, um, you know, I've really, you, I've really found that improv is, is very insightful for that, because uh, in improv, you think that, um, you know, improv, Tina Fey, Will Ferrell, Amy Poehler, uh, all these guys use, and you think, oh yeah, no, they're just naturally creative people. Well, in an improv scene, uh, you have three minutes to come up with the character, establish a relationship with the other character, find the conflict, find what's funny, heighten it three times, and edit the scene. Okay? So there's actually a ton of structure to improv. While as yet, if you're writing a novel, in um, 2004 I wrote a novel here at Bozeman, uh, and you know, if you looked at all the storyboarding I did for the scenes, and for the character I wrote out what was in their wardrobe, which hand did they brush their teeth with? Okay, little snippets of scenes. So then I can take all of this structure and come up with a supposed, what every <coughs> looks is supposed to be is an effortless story. So even the super creatives, uh, my business partner Alexander Julian, who's a fashion designer, you know, he has a lot of structure even though he's naturally super creative. Because even on the bad days, he's got to still produce. Days, you're going to have bad days, but you still got to get, get, get the design out. So that's a brief introduction to how do we take the fuzzy ideas. Uh, on Saturday, we'll talk more about group ideation pieces. And now that you're starting to work through some of these fuzzy ideas, how do you get to uh, a product or service haiku? So we'll go go through that right now. Are there any questions right now? Question back here. I love it. She made the bold choice to ask a question. I love it. Uh, I am interested in design as well, and I'm just wondering how these processes are integrated into like designing fashion and things like that. Is it the editing So let me give you an example. Um, it, home furnishings is highly influenced by uh, the apparel business. Uh, all of our color stories. My wife was uh, a, an assistant fashion designer when we met. And um, uh, when I got in the design business, I started bringing my work home. So I brought my L and my, I brought my bow home. And in bed, I would flip through the pages and look at it and see what colors were really relevant so I could come up with color stories which she found absolutely hilarious that me, an ex-investment banker, is now paging through Bo and now I'm saying, oh, that color's really hot. <laughs> okay. so, so, you know, with respect to uh, the design pieces, I'm really out there, um, and I'll contrast it. For myself, I'm out there looking for overall trends. You know, um, in home furnishings, mid-century to me is always hot. So I kind of work from my trends down to specific styles. While as yet, Alex is a, is a colorist. Um, and so he'll start playing with colors a lot more. He doesn't look as much as where the market is. Uh, though, I think he's pretending. He pays attention. Because I noticed that, for example, collar widths in his latest styles are fairly, you know, they're starting to get a little bit wider. Just as ties are slowly starting to work their way wide now that we're in the post Madigan era, era. So <clears throat> there it really starts talking about what the influences are and coming up with, you know, we, we're doing a sportswear project where we came up with 35 different patterns and then we edited it down to about 10 and then we talked to our, uh, our distribution partner. So a lot of it is really integrating this whole, he doesn't use a fancy acronym like price, he just kind of loses it. But um, I really think that it's very important to go through this and get into the edit feature, which is really what this product haiku piece gets into. Now, 
question of, of, of enterprise, you know, I really think that commercial and social enterprise, 85% of the DNA is pretty much the same. There's about a 15% deviation. So a lot of those issues will get into some of the in the product type here. Okay. Yeah. Hi, my name is Joe Sardop, and I'm here to help you start up simply. Simply, start up. Today we're going to discuss the product definition haiku. <coughs> My friend Jim asked me, how do you turn an idea into a product or service? Ideas are like nuggets which have to be hammered, treated, and shaped to become a product. Ideas are often fuzzy and huge, while a successful product or service has to be defined clearly by making trade-offs. A clear product definition includes the problem you're trying to solve, who the user is, what the solution is, along with its key features and benefits. Once you have an idea, get the opinion of as many potential users as you can. The most common and often disastrous mistake is that entrepreneurs create products and services and enterprises without getting input from the users. Entrepreneurs think they know what the users want, even though they have not checked with Walk in their shoes, understand their environment and what is important to them. Before finalizing a product definition, get the opinion of as many users as you can. Let's look at the product template. Here we are in the product haiku tab. The product haiku basically takes a fuzzy idea and distills it to a really clear product or service definition. This will help you make it a lot easier to execute these products. There are several areas uh, which you need to answer in order to complete the product haiku. Uh, the first is, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Secondly, describe the specific characteristics of the user, their age, gender, what their preferences are. Um, in the next section, you want to describe specifically what is the solution uh, of the user's problem. And what are the key features? Write down the three to five defining characteristics of it. Then we talk about the key benefits. What are the advantages that the user are going to have if they use your product or your service? In the next section, we talk about how your product or service is different from what is out there, what differentiates it, as well as what's a target price In the next section, we talk about how you are going to develop, uh, as well as how much developing the product will cost. Where will the product be made? Will you be making it in-house yourself, or will it be outsourced to someone else? And finally, we go through uh, the next steps to turn your idea into a prototype. So the questions are easy, but uh, the answers may require more time and Research. There you have it. You're all ready to do the product haiku. A product definition is a set of trade-offs that are made so you have a clear idea of what your product is or is not. With this clear definition, you can test the concept with as many users and advisors as you can. Understand the user universe as much as you can. Creating new products and services requires a great deal of refinement well before you actually start making or selling. Today we discuss the product definition haiku. My name is Joe Startup, and I'm here to help you start up simply. Simply, start up. So, earlier this year, uh, the uh, Fulbright Scholar uh, program asked me to uh, judge uh, their, some of their international programs uh, because they were going to go and they, they were able to identify some funding for some projects. So we got together these really smart people from all over the planet, and I was honored to be part of that. Uh, and there was so much intellectual firepower there. Um, and I find it very interesting that um, uh, scientists and, and physicians, you know, when they were coming up with ideas to help uh, in, their, in their respective countries, they didn't really have a clear understanding of who their user was and what their needs were. And uh, I think that 
something like a product uh, haiku or service haiku has equal applications in social enterprises as they do for commercial enterprises. Uh, so that's really what the product definition is, is going from these fuzzy ideas to you get to something. You know, doing a, doing a startup and, and doing a product or service, it's about making a series of trade-offs. And the worst thing you can do is keep it unclear. Even if you make the wrong decision on the trade-off, after you do more testing and prototyping later, you're gonna find that. So that specificity is, is really essential for you being successful to um, really trying to launch something uh, that will be able to sustain itself. Now there's one more module of which won't have time to go through, um, but it is it is called the Enterprise Haiku, which is a, basically a one-page uh, snapshot of all the things I think you need to know, kind of a one-page cheat sheet, which includes uh, you know who who your user is, what sort of description there is, who your first users could be, what the sales cycle is like, what are key dates for you. There are buckets here for you to fill up on what are the key things you need to do um, to, to get things going, uh, as well as what the key message is, what open questions you may have, a break-even analysis, analysis, as well as potential funding sources and what you need the most help. Now, the, the module explains all of this. In all of these, there are examples of other folks. Uh, in this particular case, it was a kid's So it just gives you an idea of, it's kind of a playbook for what you, what you need to do. Now we have nine minutes left in this beautiful session because I want to get you guys out fairly promptly. I wanted to see if anybody had any questions about uh, the, uh, the creative process here. How often do you see people that are in the middle, you know, when you read about startups and I've done a few companies in my career, and the, uh, you know, a lot of times your original process and then you'll, your, your end product is totally different. Yeah. How often do you recommend, let's say that you're in the middle of your company and you've got a product and you've got cash flow and your things are moving right along, have, have you found it valuable? I'm sitting there thinking this might be a good idea just to every year or two just to go through this and see if you can tweak what you're doing to improve it. I mean, do you see uh, that process being valuable? Absolutely. I think this is essential particularly new product development, this is a no-brainer. But I, I think that this, these should be living documents. And because as you know, the customer you thought you were going to have, it, it didn't quite work out. Something else is really taking off. And you know, I think that in, in the coming years, there's only going to be one way that you're going to differentiate yourself, is your ability in which to differentiate, is, is your ability in which to so I'm a big fan of critical thinking, collaboration, creativity. Well, that's great. So how does that manifest to what am I doing today? And how can I get a product that I'm going to be able to sell more product on? That's, I, I think that you hit on a great point, is let's go back and say, well, this is what we thought. Let's do a 90-day check and say, is this matching what we thought it was going to be? What adjustments do we do? If we're making the adjustments with the product here, what impact does that have? respect to my marketing collateral, what are my communications with sales or in my website. Uh, those pieces are, are really important. You know, it used to be when I did a business plan and I raised money, my first one I raised eight million bucks. What did I do with that business plan? I stuck it up on the shelf. Right? Now you've got to you've got to constantly you've got to make your learning cycles as short as possible. Because guess what? There's always someone that's five years younger than it's going to put two more hours in than you are. So you got to use your brain to, 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 keep, it, to keep ahead and, and, and to, to innovate, really, and to come up with really cool stuff. Good question.
question back there? So Chris, uh, um, here you talk about um, your background in, in learning to design lamps. Yes. And you know, thinking that you weren't creative, but turning out that you were quite good at it. It really resonates with me because I um, have an engineering background. My whole life, I was told I'm not creative. Like I had an A in math and an F in art, like all the way through school. And so it just kind of got pounded in my head. And so. It wasn't until maybe 10 years ago when I found myself as an entrepreneur in a business situation where I needed to be creative. And so I went out and ordered all these books and, and read them. It turned out like you, hey, I wasn't that bad at it. You know, all along, I, I can't draw for the life of me. But in the, right, in the right situation, I can be creative. So my question for you is, are you this thinking, this uh, design thinking, this innovation, 
Are you are you starting to see this in school and at, at either in before college or college or grad school? Because I think this is so important to the education process. Well, I got to tell you, um, when I heard about design thinking and got excited about it, I went out and bought a bunch of books on it, right? And they're like this thick. And I'm like, man, I'm not going to get through this thing, right? So, you know, I, I, I talked to a lot of um, design professionals and really tried to come up with a process where it can be somewhat bite sized. I mean, we just spent, you guys just spent 13 minutes watching videos. And you have, I think you have a pretty good idea of what design thinking is about. So, um, you know, I was talking to the, a group of engineers yesterday. And a group of uh, folks taking art classes the day before, and I'm looking at these guys and their and gals, and I'm thinking, gosh, you know, when these guys figure out how to use design thinking and learn a few uh, business toolkits, they're going to rock it <clears throat> because they're going to have that left and right brain piece down. So I think I, you know, I'm I'm particularly excited about. Excited about folks in the arts that are doing that, and I think that the business folks in here are thinking, you know, something. This creativity thing, this thing's going to blow up in entrepreneurship. It's going to be really big because it's really just innovation, right? It's trying to make something a little better tomorrow than it is today, and that that gets me really fired up. So I'm, I'm glad you shared your story. That yeah, I guess I am. A Seven oh one. So I apologize. We are one minute past thing uh, here. Now, if you got a little taste for this, uh, the group sessions are chaotic. There's a lot of things going around. I do encourage you guys, to, if you do join me or join us, uh, come up with what makes me frustrated. Thank you.